morning. Welcome to River Community Church. Not good morning. <laughs> Sometime we'll get some lights. It'll be all good. I don't know what changed, but that's all good. Good morning. Welcome to River Community Church. My name is Sam. I'm going to talk in the dark for a minute. Glad to have you here with us this morning. If you're watching online, thanks for watching online this morning. Uh, we are in the middle. Oh, there we go. <laughs> We are in the midst of a scene. Oh, that's clap. I like, yeah, we can clap for them. Way to go. Got it figured out. All right, good deal. Thank you guys. They do awesome stuff, by the way. Total aside, just for a second, the amount of time and effort that people put into media and sound and lights and everything is unbelievable. Uh, we can. Let's actually give them a round of applause quick, because that is awesome. And uh, even today, there was a little snafu, apparently, with, like, sound or something. Like, there's always something, but it's never their fault, because it's always, like, a chord or some weird thing. Sometimes it's their fault, but most of the time, it's not their fault. Uh, anyways, okay, I've dug myself a big hole. Let's get into the service. Um, so we're in a series right now called Alive, and it's a, an addition of what we've done from last week with Easter. We are in the midst of this new series, and I'm super excited about it. some really good stuff. Because uh, last weekend, we, we, we celebrated Easter, right? We celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus literally coming to life, the most alive anybody has ever been, fully and completely alive, and uh, now in heaven. And, and this is a crazy thing, right? We celebrated that this last weekend. But in the days after Jesus was resurrected, there were some, some kind of wild things that happened. Jesus showed up in different places and different situations and, and would literally reveal himself in a physical body to his disciples, to his followers, so that they were able to see him in real flesh and blood life. It, it was wild. And, and there's this one particular moment. Uh, one particular time where he reveals himself to his disciples. Uh, they're in this room. The disciples are, and, and they're like, you got to get yourself in this moment. They are afraid for their life. I mean, the person they had just followed, had been following, had literally been put on a cross and killed. Like, what are they going to do to them next, right? They, they believed he was resurrected, but they're afraid for their life. And so they're in an upper room, meeting together, like, what are we going to do next? What, what, what's the next step? What are we going to do? And so they sit there in that upper room, and they've locked the doors. There is no getting in or out of that space because they needed to be safe. And all of a sudden, as they were sitting there in that room, 10 of the disciples, it was everybody but Thomas, Jesus shows up. And Jesus says, peace be with you. And they, they see him, they experience him. He's right there with them in the room. And, and then he, he leaves and, and they open the doors and, and Thomas shows up and they're like, Thomas, we just saw Jesus. Can you believe it? And he's like... Uh, I don't believe you. And this is what it says in, in the Bible. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand in the si into the wound in his side. Only then, only when I put my hands in those holes will I believe. I'm curious this morning, has that ever been you? Has that ever been something that you've said? I'll believe when. I mean, we have these sayings, right? These phrases that we use like, I'll believe it when I see it. Or fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Or if you don't trust anyone, you can't get hurt by anyone. These are the kinds of sentiments we use to keep ourselves safe. The problem is they also prevent us from living alive. These are the, the things that prevent us, these attitudes that keep us from living alive. Last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we talked about how in order to live alive, you need to let go of control and give that control to Jesus. This week, we're going to get into the nitty and gritty about that, about how that works itself out in our lives. And in order to do that, in order to bring how to live a life back into focus, we need to name the things. We need to name them. We need to identify them so that we can step through them. Uh, at home, I'm curious, do, do any of you have honey-do lists? 
Raise your hands. Are there any honey-do lists? A few honey-do lists. Not that many. I'm surprised. Maybe you should have a honey-do list and your hand should be raised right now, but it's not. Um, for, for me, like, there's always that honey-do list like, in your brain, right? There's all these things that you feel like you're probably supposed to do, uh, but then like, you, you have like, an afternoon Saturday, and like, I don't know really which one I should focus on, so you kind of waste a bunch of time walking around, and then you don't get anything done, or worse, you, you go to Ace Hardware to grab something. You grab one thing when you should have grabbed like 17 different things for the honey-do list. How many of you have done that? Left, not burning home the stuff? Yeah, that's like a regular weekly thing. Um, but this last week, I, I did something. Uh, we did something at home where we actually like, made the list. Like we actually wrote down, here's the honey-do list stuff, right? Like these are the things that we need to get done, which is, which is great because now like when you go to Ace, you can actually like look at the list and remember, oh, I can get these few things to get this done. It's, it's a beautiful thing. But, but if you don't do that, if you don't write down the list, you're just walking around the house like I probably should maybe do these three things, but we talked about something, but I don't know, so I'm just gonna go watch TV on the couch, right? Like that's, that's, that's how these things work. You have to name the things in order for them to get addressed. Otherwise, they just elusively live out there somewhere and they never get done. Today, we're going to name the things. We're going to name three things. There are more, but we're going to name three of them. Three things that prevent us from living alive. Here they are. I'm just going to list all three right away. The first one is cynicism. Second one is numbness. And the third one is self-righteousness. Cynicism, numbness, and self-righteousness. Each of these things are attitudes. That's what they are, attitudes. Each of them are attitudes that produce a way of living that narrows the degree to which we experience life. More importantly, they narrow the way we experience God's love and gifts that he offers us. When we're having those attitudes in our life, we are less likely to be grateful for, like Melissa was talking about before, the, the good gifts that God is offering us in our life right now. Now each of these things, they, they arrive in our life, they play out in our life as a response to some kind of stress in our life. There are ways we deal with that stress. There are natural ways that we deal with that stress. Even if they're a bit unhealthy, they're natural ways. It, it naturally happens. And today, we're going to look at how, in the aftermath of Jesus' death and resurrection, we see each of these attitudes emerge in different people. So we're just going to dive right in and go through each of these three things, and let's start with cynicism. Cynicism, the definition of being cynical is believing that people are motivated purely by self-interest, distrustful of human sincerity or integrity. Another definition is this, concerned only with one's own interests and typically disregarding accepted or appropriate standards in order to achieve them. Essentially, a cynic lives in a world without trust. They lean toward believing no one can be trusted. It's their way of feeling safe. It's their way of feeling safe in this world. You know who was a cynic? Thomas was a cynic. Doubting Thomas was a cynic. He'd been jaded by what happened to Jesus. All his hope and trust had been, had been placed in this guy, Jesus. And then he goes and gets crucified on the cross. And, and like everybody's after them. It's all scary and frightening. He's not going to trust them again, right? He felt like he'd been let down. So don't try to, to get him to believe these tall tales about Jesus being resurrected. Why would I do that? Like, You've got to show me the nail holes, right? We become cynics when we get hurt when our trust is betrayed, when we put our armor back on and we put the world on notice, I'm not going to fall for your tricks anymore, world. I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to believe it. That's what makes us cynical. Now, cynical cynicism prevents us from living alive because it slowly narrows our world. It steals away our sense of, of wonder because everything is by default not believable. And people, well, people are the least believable, which means we become incapable of receiving or trusting when people try to love us. Cynical people 
they come across as powerful. Like they feel like they have this power and this relationship sort of thing, but, but that power is a front that they use to hide the deep fear that they'll be duped again. That's cynicism. The second attitude we can naturally develop to deal with life when it gets hard is this. Go numb. Numb it out. Numb out the pain. The, the definition is, of numb is deprived of the power of sensation or deprive of feeling or responsiveness. You numb yourself. You deprive yourself of feeling or responsiveness. You are numb. You're numb when you stop feeling. You might be numbing things when you stop engaging with people. If you kind of hold everything at a distance. When the thought of sitting with someone and having an honest conversation about what it is that's going inside of your head or your heart or your gut or your body sounds like pure torture. Like the idea of actually talking to someone about those things sounds scary as all it can be. Chances are, if that's the case, you've been numbing some things and it's preventing you from living fully alive. Peter was numb. Peter was still numb. Peter was one of Jesus' disciples and he had denied three times even knowing Jesus. Jesus had predicted it. He said, hey, Peter, before this night's over, you're going to deny three times even knowing me. And Peter's like, nope, not going to happen. I'm going to follow you to the end, Jesus. And then hours later, he says, I don't know the guy. I don't know the guy. I don't even know the man. And then, like Jesus said what happened, the rooster crows. And Jesus' words flash through his eyes. And the tears come draining down and the sobbing is uncontrollable so he races out of the courtyard and proceeds to numb himself and act like it never happened. Skip ahead. A number of days, Jesus had resurrected. He was alive, more fully alive than any of us have yet experienced. And he showed up while Peter and a few of the other disciples were numbing, or, or another word for going fishing. Um, so they went fishing, <laughs> and they were going out. Back. Like that was their job, right? That's how they were making money. So they were going out, they were fishing, they were making some money, doing their thing. Maybe it was early in the morning. They said it was early in the morning, so trying to get out early for that. And, and they've been out fishing, but the, the nets were not filling up. They're catching nothing. And so after a little while, somebody shows up on the shore, and, and he yells out, hey, how's the fishing? And they say, awful, there's nothing. And he says to them, he says, hey, why don't you take your nets and throw them on the other side of the boat? And they're like, well, what do you know? But I guess, why not try it? And so they throw the nets to the other side, and, and suddenly they begin f become filled, like bursting with fish, so much so they can barely get out. They think they're going to sink. And, and they realize in that moment, oh, that guy, that, that's Jesus. So they race to the shore, get to the shore with the fish, and then Jesus is waiting there with a fire, and they sit and they have breakfast together. It's crazy. And after breakfast, Jesus pulls Peter aside, and they have this conversation. It says, after breakfast, Jesus asks Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time, he asked him. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. That third time. Can you imagine that third time? Peter had spent the past days numbing, keeping busy, wanting to forget what had happened, what he had done. And Jesus said it three times. Like saying, I know what happened. I predicted it was going to happen, and I know it happened. I know you denied knowing me. It's time to move past it, though, Peter. 
It's time to get over it. Stop ignoring the important work I've trained you for. You need to go now and, and acknowledge that you denied knowing me three times so you can let go of it, but then get ready and get going because I'm leading you somewhere and I have a purpose and a plan for you very specifically, Peter. Numbness. It happens when it's too frightening to face what happened so we refuse to go there. We distract ourselves with things that can take the pain away. Some go to substances for this. Many of us just go to busyness. Pure, straight up, I'm going to keep myself busy. Most of us, we, we distract with work or screens or focusing on other people. Anything to not feel it ourselves. Growing numb prevents us from living alive because as much as it prevents us from feeling pain, it prevents us more so from feeling joy and connection and love. It also isolates us by telling the people closest to us that we are closed for business. Closed for business. The, the open sign is turned off. So we slowly lose the people we care about the most. Numbness keeps us from feeling and it isolates us. Third, self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is defined as this. It is having or, having or characterized by a certainty, especially an unfounded one, that one is totally correct or morally superior. Self-righteousness means exactly what it says. I'm right, self-right, no matter what. You might be self-righteous if you never change your opinion. I feel like we could make a, a Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy moment with this, right? Like, you might be self-righteous if, you might be self-righteous if you feel like this life has a lot of us versus them situations. You might be self-righteous if you only see things in black and white. You might be self-righteous if your friends are only your friends because they agree with you. You might be self-righteous if fill in the blank. There's a lie that spread about Jesus after his resurrection, and it's a perfect picture of what self-righteousness looks like when it plays out. It says this in Matthew 28. It says, as the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get into trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. A self-righteous person is not committed to the truth. They're committed to their own version of the truth. And they'll do anything to convince you that their truth is the truth. Of all three attitudes that prevent us from living alive, this one is probably the hardest to address, acknowledge, and recover from. These leading priests that we know of never recovered. The one example we do have of a, of a self-righteous person that does recover is Paul, right? Paul wrote a bunch of the New Testament, a bunch of letters, but before he was Paul, he was Saul, and he was out to get the church to the point where he was on the way to put some chains on people's hands and take them back to be tried. But on the way, it took a flash of light and an audible voice of Jesus to finally convince him that he was not right. His version of truth was not the truth. That's what it took. It's hard to break someone out of a self-righteousness set of ideas. Self-righteousness happens when we view the world in black and white terms and we find our security in being right, even if we're not. The world turns into a hundred different us versus them battles. Self-righteous people want to draw circles like this one. They want to draw a circle 
and say, here is what's true according to me. And if you believe my set of what's true, you can be on the inside of this circle. But if any part of what I believe you don't believe, you're on the outside of this circle. And what happens is the, the lines of the circle slowly over time become more and more condensed that only a few people believe what's on the inside of the circle and only a few people are included inside of the circle until only one person is left and that's you by yourself inside the circle. That's what self-righteousness looks like when it plays out over the long term. There are churches that act this way that here's this one quirky rule that we're going to focus on, and if you don't believe it, you're on the outside of the circle. And it, over time, gets smaller and smaller and smaller and reaches fewer and fewer people with the hope of Jesus. I don't think that's what Jesus calls us to. I think Jesus calls us something very different, something that looks a little bit more like this. For me, this is what Jesus calls us to, where there is a point in the center, that once you realize, hey, Jesus really is who he said he is, and I believe in him, and I have transferred leadership of my life from myself or somebody else or some other thing to Jesus, that true north of who Jesus is is put at the center, and over our lifetime, we are pointed closer and closer to the center of where Jesus is. We might start out a long ways away, but now there's true north. And so we, over years of our life, draw closer and closer to him. And not only that, but we are pointing other people toward that person named Jesus. So once you believe, you're on the map. And it's just a matter of drawing closer and closer to him over the years. If you go back a slide uh, to the circle, you'll notice if those dots represent people, in in a circle situation, everybody hangs out right around the edge. What is the bare minimum I need to do to get inside the circle? What's the bare minimum? And the other one, everybody gets drawn closer and closer and closer to Jesus. If we could spend our time pointing to people and pointing people to draw closer to Jesus, trusting that Jesus' Holy Spirit will do the refining and convicting work inside of a person's character as they hear the truth about who Jesus is and who he calls us to be, we would be in a much better place. Self-righteousness, it, it prevents us. It prevents us from living alive by turning us into our own God. Our pride rules. We become the person who has all the answers for what is right and wrong. And the result is a life of constantly fighting battles like turf wars, trying to convince other people why you're right and they're wrong. It's exhausting. It's literally just plain exhausting. It doesn't work, and it leaves you feeling misunderstood, angry, and on edge. So we've got three things, right? We've got three things, cynicism, numbness, and self-righteousness. These are three things that prevent us from really living alive. Which brings us to the question, The question is, how, in the face of these three things that prevent us from really experiencing life, do we bring living alive back into focus? How do we do it? The the show that our family has watched recently, it's called Special Forces. Has anybody watched this show? Raise your hand. A couple people, all right. Nobody else and any of the others, way to go. Um, But anyway, so Special Forces is about this. Uh, It's about a number of celebrities who who, uh, go and go through like actual Special Forces training. So they, they go through this thing, like Navy SEAL level training, and it's nuts, like it's, it's a little crazy. Like the, these people, they, they go up and like jump off helicopters, like do wire walks across huge ridges, have to like go in like gas chambers with gas masks and take the gas mask off, it's, it's nuts. Crazy stuff. And all the while they're being yelled at, screamed at, told they're not good enough, told they need to work harder, made to do calisthenics at all times of day, crazy heat, awful food, barely any sleep, breaking them down to their literal core. It's, it's awful, right? It sounds like a really fun time. Who wants to sign up? Um, but anyways, over the process, what will happen is some people will break down. They'll like get to the end of themselves and literally just break. And then that evening, they'll, they'll call that person into this kind of private room and they'll have a conversation with them and inevitably they break down. And instead of when they break down saying, hey, hold it together, 
They say the opposite. Like these are special forces, tough guys. They say, let it out now. Now is when you cry. Now is when you get this stuff out. Why did that hit you so hard? Because you've got to be safe somewhere. You've got to let it out sometime. Near the end of the show, they have this one thing that they do that's probably one of the hardest things, but it's the least physically difficult. They're asked to write a letter, the letter that you write um, that goes to your family if you were lost in combat. And they made them read it out loud. And this is a clip of, of what that looks like. To my family, my mom, Matt, and dad, our time together meant the most to me in this whole earthly experience. All of you were there when I showed up in this world. Sadly, you will still, sadly, you're still here while I leave. I love you. Thank you for giving me your heart. As you know, you had mine. Ah, that's so hard. <clears throat> I love you. I will be with our fallen family members in heaven and will be watching over you. That guy has a Super Bowl ring. He's a man's man, if there are any. That was the only thing that broke him. To live a life, it is required that we realize what matters most. Some people are faced with moments like that. Those moments rarely feel good. They're excruciating. But they can become the thing that wakes people up to living a life. Health scares, close calls, tragedies, moments where life gets very real, very fast. These moments in life can do one of two things. Either they can send us into protection mode, run into numb, become cynical or self-righteous and live a bitter cold life. Or they can force us to see things clearly and bring living alive into focus. In order to live alive, you have to get to the point where you realize that the power those three things claim to offer you, cynicism, numbness, self-righteousness, you have to realize that their power isn't worth it. And then, realizing that that power isn't worth it, you have to be willing to accept their antidote. The antidote to self-righteousness is humility. Being right in other people's eyes isn't all it's cracked up to be. When you're willing to say, I might be wrong, or I was wrong, you're affirming for yourself this very important thing. I'm not God. And that's healthy. That's healthy for us to affirm that. Additionally, and this is super important for those of us who think we know a lot about God. God doesn't need you to defend him. Sometimes we become so convinced of our understanding of, of who God is that, that we start to demand that other people see God how we see God. And FYI, for your information, that limits God. Because of course we don't have the corner on perfectly understanding who God is. We have the Bible and that points perfectly to God, but we're not perfect at understanding it. And so if you think you fully understand God, then that thing that you claim to fully understand stops being God when you think you understand him. Because God is by definition beyond our understanding. So... Allow yourself to be freed by God from the responsibility of always being right. The religious leaders of Jesus' day felt the need to be right so deeply that they missed Jesus and then caused others to likely miss Jesus too. Don't make that same mistake. The antidote to numbness is hope and purpose. When Jesus said three times to Peter, feed my sheep, he was doing two things for Peter. He was, he was telling Peter, you can feel forgiven. Let it go. And then 
He was telling him, I need you to come to terms with your mistake because I don't want your mistake getting in the way of the things I need you to be doing right now. Your purpose is too big to let that mistake keep you from it. If you feel numb, ask God to show you what you're hiding from or or stuffing down. Ask God to help you step past it and feel forgiven for it or of it. Your purpose and the things you've been missing because you've chosen to cope through numbing, those things that you, you, you've, you've decided to put to the side in place of your purpose, right? Allow that purpose to grab a hold of you and get you through that numbness. Know that there is hope and that forgiveness is available. There are people who want to experience you alive again. Maybe at one point they did, and for a long time it hasn't been there. Allow yourself to step out of feeling numb. Let them experience you, and you experience that relationship again. Let them in. The antidote to cynicism is choosing to trust. Remember that Thomas guy, right? Doubting Thomas. Not going to believe unless he puts his hands right up in there. Well, Thomas, you got a surprise. It says this in John 20. It says, Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Cynicism lives off of doubt. Doubt's not bad. Doubt isn't bad when it leads to engaging your faith and growing your faith. Doubt is detrimental when we stop at doubt and give in to cynicism. Choosing to believe and grow your faith, these are the very keys to living alive. When we believe and trust, it it awakens something inside of us. It, It helps us feel God's wonder again. It helps us recognize the gifts that God is giving us in this life again. It opens us up to who God is and how he's literally working in our life right now. Our mission as a church, and often as individuals, this has been awesome how this has played out, how how this mission of our church has has been something that so many of you have owned for yourselves. But our, our mission is to represent Jesus well. Representing Jesus well can't be faked. You can't fake it. If you try and fake it, you'll find yourself just exhausted. Representing Jesus well requires us to actually be transformed. It requires the work done on the inside, the transformation done on the inside so that the outward actions come from a genuine place of trust and hope and humility. Typically, uh, at the end of of a a sermon, I'll I'll give you a challenge or we'll give you a challenge to go out and, and act actively do something, maybe serve somebody, care for somebody, connect with somebody um, in in some way that represents Jesus well. Um, This week is going to be a little different. This week, instead of saying, hey, go out and do this, this week I I want you to take some time to do the inside work. I want you to answer this question. This week, what is the thing inside of you that is preventing you from genuinely representing Jesus well. Are you cynical? Are you numb? Have you been numbing? Are you self-righteous? And if you just answered all three of those questions with a no, you're wrong. You're wrong because all of us struggle with each and every one of these at least to some degree. So the question again for each of us is, what is the thing inside of you, numbness, uh, cynicism, self-righteousness that is preventing you from representing Jesus well in a genuine way from a transformed place inside of yourself? 
And when you realize what those things are, ask God to help you work through those things. If you want that for yourself this week, if you want to have the courage from God to take that step, I'm going to say a prayer. Ask for his courage to to help play that out in our life and then uh, that we would do so this week. Would you pray with me if you want that for yourself? Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for a love that literally comes down and cracks through the hard shells we sometimes put outside of ourselves to protect us. We know that that shell keeps us from living alive, so God, thank you for your love. Help us now to be able to recognize inside of ourselves any cynicism, any way that we're numbing ourselves from feeling, and any self-righteousness that we're holding on to to keep us safe. God, we know that safety only really comes from you. Help us to have hope again. Help us to trust you again. Help us to see your purpose And help us to be humble knowing that you are God and we are not, and that is a gift. We ask for your transforming power through your son, Jesus. We ask that it would help us to be changed, to genuinely represent you well in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.